welcome uh, to another Investmental Podcast. I uh, feel very fortunate today, guys. Um, well, actually, first of all, happy Easter weekend to everyone. Um, we are here in the podcast room on the on a good Friday. Um, fortunate enough to have Mitch, who is one of our members, uh, come join us. Join us and uh, have a little bit of a chat to uh, also talk about his journey, <clears throat> uh, maybe his perspectives, and m- maybe you know, or hopefully, we get something out of this where people can learn off each other. And that's really the purpose of why we want to do a podcast like this because. It's not just about investment talk, but it's about uh, everyone kind of learning uh, different ways, different perspectives, what other people have gone through. And throughout that, you may be able to also learn something and utilize it in your, your own kind of thinking, your own kind of uh, portfolio building, um, anything like that. So let's welcome Mitch. Thanks for joining us, man. Thank you, John. <laughs> happy Appreci- uh, Good Friday. Appreciate it. Good, and happy fr- uh, Happy Easter to everyone. Happy Easter. Yeah, yeah awesome. I mean, I feel really grateful and lucky to be in, to be able to come in and, you know, your time, be able to come in during Easter. Um, yeah, so just travel. Tra- yeah, traveling in Sydney, so really lucky to be able to meet all the, you know, the lovely uh, investmental team over the last week or so. Everyone here is just so energy loving and yeah, you know, looks cool. like they're loving your job. So Yeah, well... What brings you to Sydney? You're from Melbourne. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, what brings you here? Well, first of all, just uh, here to see some family and friends. Uh, working from home allows me to, sort of the benefit yeah. to do that. But also, um, I've been I signed up with Investmentor last year. I think about around April, May last year, yeah. and I've been you know ha- having good contact uh, good contact with my mentor Elena. And I thought, hey, you guys are based in Sydney. This is like a great opportunity to come in. Yeah, yeah. Well, Mitch, I do see your name pop up a lot when I do the. Um the, the project webinars or res- anything sort of to do with research. Uh, so because I see your name pop, all that, pop up a lot, that kind of tells me as well, you're you know, o- always looking to learn, That's right. always looking to um, uh, expand your knowledge, uh, I guess, of property. Yeah. 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 So yeah, it's always good to, to, to see you there as well. And also commenting, commenting on the, um, the, the webinars and stuff like that. I always find it, when people uh, comment that, um, because maybe sometimes when we do project webinars mm-hmm. or even research webinars, a lot of people um, live in the, near the areas that we go to, uh, and it's really good to see their own kind of perspective. Yeah. yeah. So, Mitch, where in Melbourne you, do you live? So, I currently live in the Docklands. So, for those who know uh, who are not familiar with Melbourne, Docklands is uh, just outside of the CBD. So, yeah. probably <clears throat> I'll say maybe equivalent to what your Darling Harbour or. Not as great as it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's never lived up to its standard that's meant to be, but <laughs> yeah. but it's probably equivalent in terms of distance wise mm-hmm. and just the landscape. Yeah, interesting you say Docklands. Um, wait, do you own any property there? Not in Docklands. I own property in Melbourne, but not in Docklands. Not this in Docklands. Mm. Um, what's your perspective living in Docklands like? Because, you know, I'd say that in the last seven to eight years, um, a lot of people have actually invested in Docklands. Yeah. Um, if you're not familiar with Docklands, guys, Docklands is an area, like Mitch said, it's like Melbourne's kind of version of Darling Harbour. Poor man's version. <laughs> Poor man's <laughs> version of Darling Harbour. Um, and it is just, you know, full of apartments, yeah, full of units. Yeah. Uh, I, I find it this way. Um, Docklands, wait, wait, sorry. I didn't get back to my question, Mitch, sorry. So what's it like living there? It's been different. There's been two phases, I'd say, before COVID and after sort of during COVID. Right. Before COVID, really buzzing. There was a lot of nightlife going on. There was still restaurants. Um, you know, it's close to transport. So I think yeah. quite busy, you know, quite lively. Uh, so that's why the whole reason for me to, li- to uh, went to live there and rent there. Yeah, uh, sure. So I've been there for about five years. But since COVID, very different. Yeah. More quiet. Uh, it's picked up now, but during the two sure. years of lockdown, very quiet. The rents have dropped. Well, it's good for me. That rents have dropped for me as well. Mm-hmm. Um, but also, we saw some precincts have died died away. I don't I don't know if um, many you know people know around the Docklands area. Some of the harbour it's built on the pier. Yeah. Some of the shops have had to close because of the unst- uh, unstable nature of the pier. So that's probably oh you mean 50%. like the actual foundation of the exactly. pier exactly like there was mm. a pub a few restaurants all had to close. So that's wow. probably fifty percent of the you know wow, social wow. activities. Wow. Well, let me ask you this, Mitch. Would you ever invest in Docklands since you've been living there? I'll live there, but I wouldn't invest there. You wouldn't invest? Not, okay. not an apartment. 
not an apartment in in specifically in Docklands. Yeah, yeah, and and, and generally they're high rise apartments. They're about you know twenty to thirty yep. floors. So yeah, I wouldn't invest in one of them. Yeah, um, can I ask? That, that's a good good topic um, straight off the bat um, because, like I was mentioning, seven to eight years, a lot of people invested in Docklands. Mm. Mm. Um, you mean you? I mean, uh, developers or apartment builders, they don't typically build an apartment without getting like the sales and making sure that um, people buying those properties. So you could imagine, like you said, there's heaps of apartments and high rise. And you know what, Mitch, there's even more about to come. Yeah, that's right. On yeah. that um, Fisherman's Bend yeah. area. Yeah. Uh, I guess from your perspective, um, why do you, and you know, in I have to say this as well. I do know a lot of people that have invested there as well and they haven't seen the growth um, that really they would have liked. Do you do you think it's just a oversupply of apartments? Is that what you believe? I think that's yeah. I think that's one aspect of it. Growth. What you mentioned there, John, is definitely one aspect. If you're looking for the growth, if 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 that's what you're looking for in your portfolio, I even track the one that I live in. Uh, not a huge amount of growth that I, I can sort of see. Maybe ten yep. percent at best. Uh, over mm-hmm. the last seven to ten years, uh, yep. rent-wise, it's not too bad. It was quite steady. So if it was cash flowing, yielding, I think it's still there. Mm-hmm. Um, I was paying up to four sixty a week, but then that dropped about yep. at least twenty percent. And what's that? A one bedroom? One bedroom. One bedroom. One yep. uh, bath. Yep. Um, yeah. Apartment. Yeah. Sure. Um, but do you know that in Darling Harbour, um, Sydney, mm. Piedmont, mm. do you know the properties do grow there? Okay. Yeah. Like even apartments. What sort of rates? I mean, you're talking about one bedrooms. Um, around Piedmont now, Barangaroo, yeah. you you you'll be lucky to find something that's under a mil. Wow, yeah, one bedroom, one bedroom. Wow, incredible. Um, people who had bought probably in twenty fifteen, mm. probably bought you know seven hundred thousand. Mm, mm, uh, mm. Today they're they're about a million dollars. Yeah. Now, from your perspective, I've got my perspective and theory yeah. on this. Um, what do you think? Why do you think that is? Com- if you compare, and bear in mind that Melbourne and Sydney in terms of population within those cities are very similar. In matter of fact, there's more people that live in Melbourne than there is in Sydney City. Yeah. So why why would an area like Sydney do that, but Melbourne hasn't done that yet? What do you think? I think there could be a few factors. Being a local in Melbourne, uh, in Dockland, it's, and, and I haven't, you know, I honestly haven't gone out to um, mm-hmm. Darling Harbour too much, but I know it's, it's busy, it's quite lively, mm-hmm. and there's a lot going on. It's quite hectic at times. Docklands is not the same. When the football's on, there's a stadium there. It gets a bit busy. But other than that, it definitely doesn't have as much, uh, inf- I guess, you know, infrastructure or entertainment. Sure. Uh, transport is okay. There's a tram that goes in and out, but there's not as much going on. And it's really windy. That's a really big yeah. factor. Well, well, it's funny you say that. Every time I'm in Docklands, the one thing I noticed, I think the design of the place, it creates like a whole heap of wind tunnels. Yeah. Like, yeah. because the buildings are like, and there's so many alleyways, like they've designed the buildings so that every time you just walk across it's kind of like the main part, mm. you just hear these gushes of wind. Yeah. And then it just kind of blows you off balance a little bit. Yeah. It was a little bit weird. Um and and the wind is actually quite noisy. Yeah, it is. Yeah. We live on the thirtieth floor, sometimes on a really windy and Melbourne can be, right? Uh, yeah. on a really windy day. It feels like an aeroplane taking off, you know, you got the cabin wow. a bit of shaking. Wow. You can definitely feel it. Sure. <laughs> well I'll take uh, here's my take on it. Yeah. Um it was my opinion is on it was the planning. If you look at Docklands compare if and compare it to Darling Harbour mm. or Piedmont, mm. Barangaroo, I would say now I don't have the the exact data on this, but uh, this is off the kind of off the top of my head. In Docklands, I'd say sixty, maybe seventy percent of buildings are residential. Mm-hmm. In Sydney, in Piedmont, and those areas, it's only about thirty percent. Okay, the rest are actual commercial buildings, okay. work buildings, offices. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's a different type of scarcity mm-hmm. that happens here in Darling, like in that area, Darling Harbour, Piedmont. Whereas the planning of Melbourne, they kind of decided, and I've said this a lot in my webinar, I think the difference between New South Wales and Victoria, or sp- more specifically Sydney and Melbourne, mm. the way they planned yeah. the their, I guess, um, the nature of how they wanted to get people, the population and where they want to live, mm. Melbourne decided really to concentrate on the CBD plus probably the outskirts of the CBD mm, and build mm. up. Yeah. So there's it's just a ton and shitloads of apartments there. 
if you compare that to Sydney, it's different. Like, yes, yes, there are people that live in the city, mm. but it, majority of it is hotels, um, commercial, um, yeah, that that, t- that type of thing. So um, that's what I would say the biggest difference is. And there's going to be continuously more apartments to be built, residential, um, in Docklands. And I think that's yeah, part of that's the true. reason why it, it just hasn't grown because there's just new new apartments coming up like pretty constant yeah whereas sydney you don't have that that's really interesting but i think i did pick up in one of your early webinars of earlier on last year sometime mm. you talked about apartments so apartments just because docklands is not working doesn't mean i've shut my you know sort of you know view on apartments yeah. in general as an asset class or type of mm-hmm. property um looking at sydney for example you just you just highlight a really good example of that you can have an apartment yes can be high rise but works differently depending yep. on the location yeah and exactly. the way that melbourne's planned out and and, and cbd as well in melbourne lots yeah. of lots of apartment high-rises student housing etc mm-hmm. so yeah like the new barangaroo tower the the residential mm-hmm. tower mm-hmm. um are you familiar with barangaroo not, not so not so much no. so barangaroo is like this new section of sydney that was being built probably over the last five seven years um a lot of it's got the very expensive restaurants mm, mm. um but they've got towers there now mm. that are both the casino plus the residential mm, yeah. but if you are one of the first buyers to buy in and this is going back probably 2013 2014 one bedrooms i think at that time were like seven eight hundred thousand uh today you try to get one of those you're probably one bedrooms like one point three mm. a studio will get you just a million bucks that's crazy you know what I mean, um, and 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 also because I don't know what it is, but it a possibility also could be because we have the Harbour Bridge and the mm, Opera House. Mm. True. Yeah. Like, well, if you go to Docklands, like, well, you got the Balti Bridge that takes you to the airport. <laughs> <laughs> it's not the same, is it? Yeah, I don't think it. Yeah. Might, it may not be the same be- yeah. because here in in Sydney, if you are, if your view is the bridge yeah. or the yeah. Opera House or something, it does command True. a premium yeah. and value is also look at that yeah so yeah. when they value a property they actually do say there that you know the it's a the, a premium location yeah what about the ferry do you think that plays a role because you've got the ferry that takes you to the northern beaches for example yeah. like manly and stuff that's obviously prime spots Mm-mm-mm. i think that do you think that will play a big part in sydney's sort of uh yeah uh, uh, well i get yeah i guess it does um it's funny you say that i live in northern beaches okay so i'm very familiar with this mm. manly ferry mm-hmm. <laughs> um manly ferry there's not as many people as as you might think that actually gets it to the city mm. because we have um, what we call the Beeline bus. Mm. And I keep saying this, uh, Jacob, because a lot of people here in in Sydney think Northern Beaches is far. Jacob, do you attest to this? Yes, I do think the no. Northern Beaches is far. <laughs> <laughs> right? So when people say Northern Beaches, automatically in their head, they're like, oh gosh, you live so far away. If in, in reality like manly dy is only 15 k's from the cbd yeah okay um, and the reason why they think this is because it does it will has no train station okay and it probably never will have a train station right. people in northern beaches are super opposed like totally against having a train okay um and to a lot of people outsiders they just say oh northern beaches is just too far but they don't realize that we've got this thing called a Beeline bus. Mm. It's a double-decker bus. It's the only bus in Sydney that services the Northern Beaches. Nice. Um, it comes e- literally every five minutes. Okay, and to get to the city door-to-door f- to Wynyard Station is about 30, 30 minutes because there's a designated lane only for that bus wow. from Northern Beaches to the city. That exclusive, huh? Yes. <laughs> designated lane. <laughs> It's a one lane that only that bus can go yeah. onto, well, or that, buses. Only. That makes bus rides a lot more tolerable. Yeah, and look, the buses are really good. Like yeah. they've got the USB, they've got the aircon, and it's like a double decker. It's actually, to me anyway, it's better than a train. Yeah, well, that's pretty cool. <laughs> I didn't know and you don't that. have to wait in like a train station where it's all packed. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, um, but maybe to your point, does it have an effect? Um, possibly, but I say not too much. I don't think. Yeah, there's just not many people that actually ride that, mm. that ferry. Have you been to Northern Beaches? Oh, I think I would have. I've gone uh, maybe a few years ago to some of the lookouts there. Not too manly as far as that, but definitely went to. Oh, yeah, I yeah. Forgot the forgot the name. There was a lighthouse out there somewhere. Oh, 
Did you go to Palm Beach? No, I didn't go to Palm Beach. Um, oh. Was there any place called Wilson's Lookout or Wilson's Point or something? Uh, doesn't sound familiar. I definitely caught the ferry across. I just yeah. can't remember exactly where I went. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Still okay. getting you. Yeah. Um, well, yeah. So, so you live in Docklands. Mm-hmm. Now, I think I'm very curious, Mitch, um, to know a little bit about kind of your journey in property mm-hmm. if that's okay yeah yeah absolutely yeah full yep um and you know where you are uh kind of where you want to get to and how have you you know come up to w- where you are today so i think the first thing is i i i consider you an investor um because you do have a, a portfolio um are you okay to share like yeah, how sure. many you've got yeah sure yeah so um, as an investor for yourself. Oh wait, do you own your own own home? Yeah, so we we do now. My wife and I we just recently bought, so we'll be moving out of Docklands very soon. Okay, uh, I haven't got the keys yet. Next week, actually. So wow, exciting times! It's, it is. It is. Yeah, <laughs> very exciting. different times. <laughs> so you're moving from Docklands to? I'm going to the Bayside suburbs. Uh, oh, which one? A suburb called Cheltenham. If you oh Cheltenham, yeah, yeah, with, yeah, yeah. I know Cheltenham. Yeah. Oh, that's a kind of. Is it a house? It's a it's a townhouse. As the prices are not exactly cheap either, Melbourne nah, and no. houses are commander for massive. Well, not in the Bayside suburbs. No, yeah, you yeah, know. Yeah. Um. So you're moving to a townhouse. Yeah. Um. So that's going to be your own occupier. That's right. Yeah. Right. And how many investments now? Oh, currently? so I've got, I've got, so I've got a, like really earlier on. I bought one. It's not the greatest investment. I can probably talk about it later. But that yep. was an apartment in Richmond. Yep. in Melbourne and I've got one coming up in Palm Beach in yep. uh, next year with yep. Investmentor and I've got one in New Zealand that I invest in at the moment. Wow, New Zealand. Yeah. New Zealand. To broaden out the sort of the yeah, yeah, portfolio. Yeah. So three locally, uh, Melbourne, Queensland. Uh, so your own occupiers are two in Melbourne, um, one in Queensland and one in New Zealand. That's right, yeah. Wow. Tell us, how did, how did the New Zealand one come about? Well, that was all through a like a seminar that I attended probably four, four and a half years ago. It was like, um, it was an education seminar. Now yep. at that time it was nerve wracking to sign up to that. That was very expensive. <laughs> five figures. <laughs> five, five figures. Uh, education, education tuition or course. That's right. Yeah. In property. Yes. Okay. Call it mentoring as well. Mentoring. Yep. Okay. So you paid five figures to do mentoring in, for a property in New Zealand. Yeah, it's more for the actual education side of things. So yep. the property I would look for myself and do the negotiation, et cetera, go through a process. Sure. It's more for that mentoring and the education process yep. and just the process how to adopt and invest the mindset, et cetera. Yep, yep. Interesting. Um, now, when you say five figures, um, I think a lot of people would think, obviously it would have started as, as probably like a seminar. Yeah, it did. It did. It was like a free thing, and then you sign up to like a three day thing where you pay like a thousand bucks. Either bring all the international speakers from NZ, UK, etc., yep. to talk. Uh, really, you know, motivational and really great content, mind you. And then they obviously sell the product on the yep, last yep, day yep. of the seminar. Yep. And what made that? Um, you know, so you you paid like kind of nearly on the spot. Well, sort of. I was, that was a really tough decision. I was going <laughs> flip flopping like overnight, but yeah, on the last day, I thought, yep, yeah, you know, go for it. Go for it and yeah. do it. Yes, that's right. Okay, so um, enlighten me on this, Mitch. Sure. So you, your mindset probably at that time, um, you, you've come to the seminar, and I'm, I'm assuming when you say five figures, mm-hmm. you know, you say it's quite scary. Mm-hmm. Um, what ultimately? Um, made you just go, okay, I'm going to bite the bullet and just do this course without, you know, truly understanding what you're getting yourself into because, you know, not a lot of people will pay five figures for a course. Mm. Um, And it's not like, correct me if I'm wrong here, Mm. it's not like they're, you know, search, it's not like a buyer's agency where you're paying them something and they're, they're going out there and trying to find a property. It's purely a course. Yeah. So what was that like? Like, what were you thinking? Like, it was just like, I'm going to do it and I just need to do something? I'm, I'm someone who definitely more analytical. So I take time to make my decisions, especially big ones like that, involving big sums of money like that. So mm-hmm. I had to think about, raise up the pros and cons. Like, what am I going to get out of it? Or yep. is this even a real company? Or are they even teaching real stuff? So definitely took me, you know, took time, talked to my family, talked to my wife, et cetera. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, so it gave me at least two, three days to think about it. Yep. And then I thought, wait it up. I had to t- make the decision to invest in myself first, yep. uh, into my future, 
and then I guess you know, become the property investor second. I have to first take the first step to educate myself and as opposed to say, I could engage a buyer's agent, and I can still do that. I think they're still useful, definitely, mm-hmm. for purposes, but that's just for a one-off transaction. Next one, I will have to keep going back to the same thing and just sort of you know, t- trust in someone else's sure. uh, wisdom or advice. Interesting, interesting, Mitch. I call this, uh, I like the word you just used. You said it, um, if you engage in sort of like buyer's agents, which is still good, your, your mind was like, that's more of a transaction. You're more focused right. on working on yourself. That's right. That's more of a transition. So from transaction transition. to transition, yeah. and yeah. Then we're talking about a transition of you know the way you want to, th- the way you think, I guess, um, the way you want to go, go about um, when you look at properties mm-hmm. and you know um, all of that. So interesting transaction. Uh, you're looking at transition mindset transition over the transaction. Now you you go into a course and you do. At this point, do you have any properties? Uh, yes, just the one that I had, you know, in Richmond. In so Richmond. That was like, and I wanted to live in it for a bit. And uh, yep. it was a one bedroom apartment. I wanted to live in it for a bit. I also wanted closer to the, you know, the CBD. And at the same time, I thought, oh, okay, after living it for a year and a half, I mm. can maybe rent it out. It's sort of like a mishmash of everything and doesn't really achieve what I, you know, I didn't really know what I wanted at the, at the time. Yeah, okay. So I had one. So you had one apartment in Richmond. That's right. Um, and then after that, you you said, okay, let's, let's go for this. Um, paid it. Mm-hmm. Can I ask, um, looking back now, what was the biggest thing you learned in that course? Because you, it's quite a bit of money, five figures. Yeah. yeah. What's the biggest thing you learned? Quite a lot of things, but I think the biggest thing is definitely the mindset, just how to think differently about property, how to look right. at it differently, especially about you know what property, how to look at the numbers behind things, um, what, what does yield really mean, and what, do I, what does it mean to the money that I invest? Right, interesting. Okay. And you say that at that point, they don't actually help you find a property. You still have to find the property. Yeah. So we go through what the what the journey entails was is a three day. I flew up to New Zealand for this. There was a three day, uh, like one on one training with one of the you know experienced mentors. They just take you through the pro- uh, process, go through what all the buying rule, uh, sorry, the buying requirements are. How does a contract uh, process work? Mm-hmm. Due diligence process, which is really, really important. Um, even looking for property as simple as how do you, this is how you jump on a website, you locate this on like they say realestate.com equivalent. This is how you, you know, sort of do the initial analysis within half an hour and actually did a live mock call to an agent. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay, so they teach you um, how to search for properties yeah. online and then yeah. do the actual call yeah. to the agent That's and right. kind of probably negotiate. Exactly. Yeah. Um, how yeah. to find out the price, maybe those sort of stuff. Yeah, negotiation tactics and then all yep. that stuff that comes after yep. once you land a property in contract. And did you go through the whole thing and you bought? Obviously, you bought. Yeah. Um, how long from the mentorship till you actually bought a property? Well, that, a lot of students that are in the sort of the network, they buy literally within the days or just weeks. Me, it took me a bit longer. I did find something, you know, uh, put it under contract, I think, I believe, but that one didn't work out. Got spook- you know, got a little bit spooked out. And for me, that's a foreign thing as well, foreign country, didn't know what's going on. Mm-hmm. What happens is New Zealand tends to have a thing called meth, like drug, drug tests. I have to do drug tests and I have a meth issue. The particular one, I was looking regional and the meth test came back really bad and in terms of the, the amount of sort of uh, mm-hmm. works required, amount of money required to actually rectify it was too much. The numbers didn't sort of add up. And at that time, I was getting a bit spooked out by all the costs and renovation costs. So I thought, no, nah, cancel the contract. Yep, yep. Um, so then sort of, you know, mm-hmm. once, that, once I went, the momentum sort of slipped out, uh, you know, went down a bit. But within a year and a half during sort of COVID, I had a lot more time on my hands that's when i picked up again and sure thought, sure i need to have another crack at this right so you, you you're in new zealand you've learned all what they've taught you um and then you come back to you try to do it there then it didn't work out you come back to australia um during COVID, and you're like okay let's have another crack so from that point though all the methods that they t- taught mm. you to mm. call agents you were using that here to find um yeah absolutely the, the, the yeah. place and Offshore. then yeah, yeah. um wh- and if you don't mind me asking, what area did you end up going with in New Zealand? So it's in the th- South Island, Southland, is pretty much the lowest point of uh, the South Island. So it's a it's a region called Invercargill. Okay. Down in south of New Zealand. So yep. it's, a, it's a very much a regional area. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They've got a university there, I guess, that drives a little bit of the demand, but it's very much regional. Sure, sure. Um, and was it like uh, renovation type? Yeah. It's it's a, a little bit of a door. Not, not too much. Probably about a, uh, I'll call it cosmetic renovations. Cosmetic renovations, yeah. okay. 
Um, and how's how's that? Uh, how long you've had that now? So if you did it in COVID, what two years? Yeah, maybe uh, just over a year. I'll say a year and a half. Yeah. Yeah. It's renting out okay. Renting out really good in terms of yield. Um, I'd say well maybe close to eight nine percent. I'd say. Eight to nine percent. Yeah, maybe after Reno, you're looking at about seven to eight percent. Wow. Yeah, decent. Wow. Okay. Was it a big price that you had to put in? So regional New Zealand. New Zealand prices have shot up a lot in the last two three years, uh, and same with they they've rode the COVID wave as well. Um, it shot up everywhere around the country, but in this particular South South Island, the reason I was looking for it was mainly for affordability at that time. Mm-mm. It was in the like the two three hundred bracket. So. Oh, not too, to three, not too yeah. bad when I bought. Yep, yeah, yep. now it's probably in the three four hundred bracket. Sure, sure. Um, for any members out there, I guess who is watching this, and uh, I guess maybe you might be thinking something similar, which is you know, should I buy New Zealand? I don't know how many people <laughs> are out there. Um, what do you reckon the big? What's the biggest advice you'd give them? Like you know, uh, in terms of if they say, "Hey, Mitch, I'm thinking about buying New Zealand. What should I look out for?" I think. Um, the probably the biggest thing is lending wise the deposit so New Zealand have um, recently well in the last year or so the government had changed their policy they've also got a supply issue as a significant supply issue mm-hmm. what I hear is you know renters can't get in rent prices going up surging and property prices surging so the government has put on a few like and I guess the good thing is the policy probably doesn't affect us Aussies as much but they've increased the lending to where if it's owner occupied or investors I think it's uh, Maximum LVR sixty percent, so you need forty percent deposit. Fa- fairly ch- uh, sizable. Mm. Um, and the other aspect is they've taken out interest deduct- deductibility. So for locals, any interest cost you cannot deduct. That's a really big sort of shift to our tax system compared wow. to our tax system. That is a big shift. So if yeah. you're an investor in New Zealand, you're not allowed to. You can't claim the interest on your mortgages. On, no. on your mortgages no. as an even like as an investment. Like if, if you've got an investment property, yep. you can't claim the interest. If it's bought after a certain date and if it's an established property, I think that's the rule. For brand new, they're different. So I think the government policy is targeting for more brand new, uh, brand new bills so people can invest in brand new bills and in that way, I guess, increases the supply. Yep. But for certain types of property, you can't claim the interest. Wow. Paid. Okay. So just to be aware for any, maybe New Zealand buyers who want to buy within New Zealand, you're saying... You require forty percent deposit. Yeah, uh, de- depending on the lenders, I think you can go second tiers. That can probably take a bit higher, yeah. but the general is yeah, okay. Sixty percent LVR. And there's no stamp duty. There is no stamp duty. That's a really yep. big pro. <laughs> yeah. So no stamp duty, but you require forty percent. So if you're going to get five hundred thousand, you what need two hundred thousand to? What's that? Yeah, two hundred thousand. Yeah, yeah. Presumably, yes. Yeah, as an investor, I think homeowners can go up to if you're first home and bu- home buyer, you can probably go up to about eighty percent. Right. Okay. Yeah. Sure. So, a, a, say a two hundred thousand dollar property, you still need eighty eighty thousand dollars. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'd say that's a pretty big entry barrier. It would be a big entry barrier for a lot of people, unless yeah. they really want to buy something that is in that two or three hundred thousand. Exactly. Yeah. Um. That would pose a challenge, I believe. And, I think. And like I think that's one of the reasons percent. why the market has slowed. It's definitely slowed. Um. When I bought the property, mm. everything was multi-offer. I did about thirteen call, well, thirteen different offers before I could get something under contract. Everything was multi-offer, and what multi-offer means is that there's multiple offers on the contract, and oh, sorry, multiple offers mm-hmm. on the property. And essentially, you, you're not guaranteed to win. You know, someone can come in with a better offer, and you only get one chance to put in your offer. If it's not the highest, then you know, off you go. The vendor's not going to negotiate with you. Um, wow. Okay. But yep. now I hear that there's properties being staying on market much longer. The time to sell is much longer, and there's you know there's less Mm-mm. less instances of multi offer unless you're maybe in like the Auckland region where it's yep. quite okay quite busy. Would you invest again in New Zealand? Absolutely. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, uh, to me, just uh, you know, I'm, I just sound that the entry price is is quite a lot. What, what what would you say in New Zealand though? Um, kind of like if like say you go to Auckland, mm. maybe or the bigger places, Auckland, mm. Wellington, these places. Mm. What's the average price there? Oh, well, I think Auckland's in the mills. It's probably yeah. close to a mill. Yeah, so similar to Melbourne, I think. Yeah, so e- even if you're trying to get five, four, five hundred thousand dollar properties, yeah. that's a big chunk of deposit. Yeah, it is. Um, yeah, that's interesting. Um, so what? If, so if, if you had, um, I guess, when I asked you, would you go back to New Zealand and invest? 
is that an option in terms of I'd I'd go back to New Zealand and invest, or would you put that into in Australia if you had that option? Yeah, I think it's it's just an option. Like you say, John, yeah. it's, it's a matter of having an option. So yeah. I don't close the door on the fact that there's an option. And mm-hmm. with the market sort of going down, there is more option to actually negotiate some decent prices that may be more favorable to the buyer as opposed to mm-hmm. you know, getting in, in a seller's, mar- uh, buy, uh, seller's market. Mm-hmm. So that's the option I'm looking at. And New Zealand, I'm looking, my strategy there is definitely established. I'm not looking at any brand new, mm-hmm. only established, yeah. established property. And I guess it's to look to create any manufacture some equity through renovations. Sure where sure. I can leverage that equity either here in Australia or then continue to New Zealand. Sure, sure. And what, what, how's the process of taking equity out there? I'm, I'm about to sort of go through that process to refinance. I haven't gone through it yet, but I'm yeah. similar. Just go through, I guess, to a lender. I'm working with a broker right sure. now to see if, what I can leverage. Well, on. it's interesting because if, you, if you're putting in a deposit of 40% and I don't know, I'm not, maybe you haven't gone too far into with the broker yet, mm. but, you know, in Australia, for example, the, the t- when you take equity out, so guys, that means when your property has grown, mm. um, you're allowed to take that money, some of that money out, uh, which is what we call refinance. Um, typically in Australia, it's about 80%. So the, the calculation in Australia is, you know, the value of your property, yeah. uh, 80% of the value minus your debt yeah. is what you can typically take out. Yeah. Some people go a little bit higher, 85, 90. Mm-hmm. I'm curious to know in New Zealand, is it still 60%? I, I believe it will be similar. Yeah, still sixty percent. With okay. with the sort of the main main lenders, uh, second tier maybe you could squeeze up. That's what I'm trying to find out. Sure. So second tier could be like like a bluestone or, uh, you know, the, maybe the non bank lenders. So sure, sure. Potentially. So, but okay. I understand sixty. Is, I'm just taking that as like a rule yep. of thumb into my calculations. Have you already done a value va- valuation on the only the desktop run like an eval, but not a um what do you call it the register valuation like where someone does a sure. walk through of yep. the of the building. Do you, do you mind me asking, like, where it went up? Um, I think it's, I would have bought around at the 250 mark. Yeah. Register uh, on the evals around the 350 ish. That's not including the renovations I've done. So that's sure. why I want to get a register done. Sure. So people, uh, the, the valuer can see the, yep. Um, yep. the additions I've added in. So hopefully get as high of a re- valuation as possible. Right, right. Um, I'm curious to see whether, how much you'll actually be able to get out. So mm-hmm. if you took, took that equity out, yep. um, To bring that money here to invest again, is that going to cost? Uh, the money to Australia? Yeah. I think it's just a matter of getting the money across. I don't think so. There's no cost. Okay. Yeah. yeah maybe some currency, you know, conversion yep. costs. Yeah, sure. Okay, interesting. So you've done your whole New Zealand one. You paid. So definitely for you now, mindset-wise, it was worth it, the, the five figures. 100%, yeah. You've come to Australia. You've invested now. So I'm picturing you with... Your apartment in Richmond, mm. you've got now your one in New Zealand. Mm. So it's mm. two very different experiences. Very different, yeah. Um, and t- very different reasons. Um, you're probably now a little bit more seasoned. Um, and then you come now and then um, get mentoring here mm. at yeah. Invest Mentor. Yeah. Again, is this part of your expansion of knowledge? Absolutely. That's definitely, I mean, I love the word mentor. So it's a great company <laughs> name. <laughs> so yeah, that, absolutely. That's first and foremost. I find that I've spent all that time, maybe in a best part of 2020, looking at New Zealand market. But then I look at the Australian market, I'm like, oh crap, I actually don't know too much. I'm like, feel like I'm an amateur. So came yeah. across Invest Mentors, yeah. signed up, really loved the content and, you know, exceptional research on that you put in, in the effort and everyone on the team, exceptional research. And it really resonates. I really like mm-hmm. the way it's presented. So that's why I've sort of, you know, come on board yeah. and, 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 and got a lot out of it. I love the content. Fantastic. So diversification. Now, let's be um, upfront here and just fully candid here. Okay. What is the difference, I guess, what, what extra things have you learned? Because you obviously would have got mentoring mm-hmm. from the New Zealand side. And I understand that's about the New Zealand market. Mm-hmm. So totally different dynamics. But in terms of uh, mentoring and mindset and what you've gone through in terms of you know, with your cash flow and stuff. Is there a difference? I'm just very curious to know as well, like from your experience, that mentoring and the mentoring you've been having here in Investment Tour, is it, do you learn the same things? Is it different? Is there other things you've learned? There's definitely different. I would say complementary. So New Zealand, that my fa- focus and in fact, the, the group uh, investment group that I work with, they're Pro- pro- focus predominantly on established, whereas investment or mm-hmm. focus on uh, I would un- understand the brand yep. new build. So that's a big, I guess, a difference there. 
and in terms of the learnings, um, New Zealand's more micro. It's about how to be an, uh, more a, of an active investor, yep. investing the know-how, getting the knowledge, getting the skills and tool sets to go out there and make the investment and negotiation uh, myself. Yep, yep. Versus uh, he, uh, as uh, at Investmental, it's on more of the uh, you know the, the macro aspects about why a certain location is coming up, why is it good, why is it you know. Sure. Yep. Uh, presents opportunity yep. and then going through it and then I guess leveraging the trust and the, and, and sure. the foundations of the mentors to then go and invest. Mm. So it's more here like um, your knowledge is expanded from different areas, yes. regions why different mm. areas. Um, so it's probably you'd say you're saying active compared to passive. Yeah, that might be a good way to put it. Yeah. 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 Um, active and less, less active. Yeah. So in terms of um, working with your mentor here, um, was there anything in the sessions um, that you learned that was a bit different in terms of mindset and looking at building a portfolio? Um, was there anything different in that? Like where, you know, you might have understood that um, to build a certain portfolio or, you know, why are you actually investing in the first place type of thing? Um, well, let me ask you that. Like y- your journey right now has brought you to two different countries. Yeah three different or one different country two different states in terms of your investment like why what what's driving you to continue this um it's similar just sorry to, sorry before mm, you continue mm. i just want to give you a stat only about 0.3 percent of australians get to about four properties yeah so you're i consider probably getting there so what's Hopefully. what's driving you that what's driving what are the reasons for you I think one of the key reasons is just surrounding myself with knowledgeable people. Like I alone can't, if I relied on myself, I can only get so far. And I find that the community and the group of you know, uh, like-minded, especially uh, ex- ex- with a, ex- the right level of expertise, mm-hmm. seasoned in what they do is important. Surrounding myself in that, because naturally I feel like I would grow listening to the content mm-hmm. that you, you know, investment or producers that allows me you know, to do that. So yeah. that's one thing. And, and, and that helps to shape my mindset as well. Uh, yep. The knowledge and 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 the uh, advice would help to shape my mindset as well. Yeah, but what, what um, I've I certainly have the same beliefs that it's the people you surround yourself with that actually does change a lot of the the paths you take in life because your conversation is different. Yeah. Um, but I guess my I think my question was more: What's the end game for you here, Mitch? Yeah. What's the end game for you? Like, what are you what are you trying to get out of? Because investing is also a very big commitment you it need is. to make. Yeah. Um, and you've made certainly a huge one in education, your learning, your knowledge, and surrounding yourself with those people. Um, and you've had to pay for that, you know, qu- quite significantly. But obviously, it's worked out for you. Um, but what's the end game like? What does it look like for you, like in you know, ten or fifteen years? Yeah, I, I'm still very much in the in the process. I would say, like the vision, yeah. I continue to, I guess, clarify my vision as you know, every day that I that I go on. But mm. the end game, I definitely is about having that choice, um, whether and, and definitely having that passive income stream to support my active income, with mm. with the goal of potentially transitioning to part time, or sure. just work on, work full time or invest full time in property. Reason being is work and employment. That's basically a single point of dependency on myself. Mm-hmm. If there's anything where to happen, or you know, lose your job, etc., and basically I have would have very little to fall back on. Yep. Whereas if you have a build up a steady income stream, that builds up, I guess, the wealth for longevity. Yep. So that's yep. one one goal. It's not the number of properties; it's building up that choice. The property opens up the possibility. So just having that opportunity mm-hmm. to do something different or do something that I really want to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is huge. Yeah, um, I like the word you use there because that's you know. I say this to a lot of people, and also myself, Mitch. That in investing is not about like you know the numbers of properties mm. and all that. It's it's at the end of the day, you will have much more different options yeah. if you did invest rather than if you didn't invest. Uh, and those options, um, you will wake up one day, and you realize that you know your properties have doubled in value. You just don't know when. Yeah, exactly. You'll just wake up, mm. and you won't even find out because you. A lot of people don't actively are looking at, oh, what's my property worth this week, next week? They don't know. Um, it's only when something triggers that they mm. might hear the news, mm. oh, properties have gone up, la, la, la. And then they start being curious and they figure, oh, man, my property's almost doubled. And if you had three of those and some have doubled, some have slightly more, then you kind of realize, oh, okay, I've got some options here now. Exactly. And yeah. that's, that's that's really, the, yeah, yeah, that's the purpose of it. Like, yeah. um, But ultimately as well, I think, 
because uh, you know I started investing as well. You know, I wouldn't say young, but you know, mid twenties. Um, so yeah. you know, the last ten to twelve years. Mm-hmm. Uh, and certainly, like when you first start out, well, this is from my experience. Um, you sort of, oh, I did anyway. Sort of question everything. Today, my decision making is very quick. Mm, mm, mm. Very quick. Um, it's just solution results type of driven, you know, um, action because you, uh, well, I've seen the what property actually does for does for me and does for people who's who's actually done it as well. Mm. And the feeling of waking up one day where you could sell, you know, half your portfolio, pay off, pay, you know, the, more of the debt on the other half. Mm. And then now you're getting almost full income from every property. Yeah. Yeah. You just, people won't have that option um, down the line. Like we've got people that email us who say, look, I'm, I'm 55 years old. I've got X amount of savings. I don't have any properties. Can I still get in? That to me, um, I feel very sad when I hear those type of, because you had so much time in your life to mm, do something. Mm, mm. Yeah. So when you talk about passive income, what number you said replace your income yeah partially at the start initially and then fully if if i can you know if yeah. that works if the numbers work out yeah that will be the end game yeah so have you worked out with what you want to achieve in terms of numbers what how many properties would that be oh so so again so it's probably not so much the number of properties because one property can probably do it if the right property comes along and it just generates enough. If I were to find like a unicorn that you're able to subdivide and put you know, additional, yep. you know, whatever and dwelling on it and then it's generating the yield, one or two of those could probably do the job. Mm-hmm. But um, I do have a sort of a number, a financial freedom figure in my head. Yep. Um, but right now it's still very much in progress. <laughs> <laughs> and it changes. It does. It yeah. changes over time. We've had uh, members uh, and friends of mine who... Uh, you know, we set out a plan of getting this many properties by this amount in mm. years to try to get this sort of mm. passive income. Mm. Sometimes you get close to it, sometimes you, you mm. don't. Um, but what I've noticed is it just changes so quickly over time. So as an example, we, we set out four properties over 10 years and then they've managed to do six or seven in seven years. Mm. Um, and that is what I call... a a so different transition in your head because the way you thought you were thinking seven mm, years ago absolutely. is different now. Yeah, totally. So you evolve like, uh, and they wouldn't have realized that mm. it's possible to get six or seven uh, in that time frame. Mm. Uh, they would have always thought four was almost impossible to do. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Uh, so yeah, you, you know, your, your path, I guess, Mitch, is you're still part of that evolution of, uh, it's like ever evolving. Ever, absolutely. Ever yeah. evolving um goals ever evolving uh you know what you want to do in the property space and all of that stuff so i guess it leads me to this question um which is now i understand that you've you you got new zealand you've got richmond uh and then you now you've got the palm beach how do you look at properties now like if, if i was to ask if i'm a friend of yours and i go mitch I need advice. Yeah. Um, I want to buy something as an investment. What's the first thing you would say to them? Oh, that's a, that's has, has that ever happened to you? Not, not quite. Not, 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 not yet. <laughs> not yet. It not will. Yeah. Because people yet. know what you've done and stuff. Yeah. They'll ask. Oh, so Mitch. They'll be like, Mitch. Um, so, so how do I start? I think, uh, well, if you're looking at a property, it depends. You know, the the brand new and the established, they're very yeah. different markets. So the brand new, definitely the one of the things, obviously why I'm working with Wealth Mentor is that's a very different market. I, I personally wouldn't have as much insights. There's just a lot of developers out there. Mm-hmm. The due diligence processes can be really murky. It's yep. not the same as established. You can't see it. Yep. So that's a pit where I definitely feel I do not have that particular expertise. But established property, if you're talking established, um, you, you got to know what you're, you're buying into. Look, definitely look at the area. The location, I think, is the mm-hmm. most important. And your strategy. Strategy, you got to get get that right. Sure. Why are you buying that particular property? For what reason? Yeah. Okay. So when you talk about uh, locations, areas, how do you kind of research your areas? Well, um, probably I'll, I'll use a lot like, of free tools. Yeah, like, yeah. It's good because yeah. a lot of people are in your position who yeah. also do their own research. Yeah. Um, but now you've got, you know, three, three properties um, of, oh, sorry, four properties. 
how would you begin your journey of this is where I want to begin? Here's my price point. Is that how you start? Um, yeah. So my, th- my particular strategy right now is looking at yield. So for me, the yield will be one of the key factors, looking at what it can rent, uh, either get the rental appraisals uh, through an agent or a leasing agent, things like mm-hmm. that, to make sure I can get that at least that rent. But then <coughs> I take a lot of, so that's where I take a lot of learnings from your um, webinars, John, is that it's not just the yield. You've got to look at uh, you know what the vacancy rates are doing, whether they, what are the population like. Uh, you've got to have a bigger population. If it's a really tiny population with a bigger yield, that could mm-hmm. still lead to er- uh, you know yep. issues in the future if the if the area just doesn't grow or suddenly collapses. But looking at the population, what's dri- is there anything driving up the population? And a lot of like li- little nifty stats I learned from you, things like looking at the um, is there any mortgage stress in that area? What are the income like? What's the average income mm-hmm. of the households there? They're really sort of yep. things that gives you a lot of telltale signs of about, about the location. Sure, sure. Um, so when you say you're, you're looking at yield, what's the, what's the percentage yield you're looking for? I think I'll be looking for anywhere at like a minimum five to eight percent for a five for to eight percent residential. Buy and hold. Yeah, residential. In Australia, it's harder to achieve. Much harder, especially Sydney, Melbourne, very hard to achieve. Mm. But interesting. What that means is five to eight percent allows you to then say interest rate. Assuming it's a four or five percent. I know we're not there yet, but assuming it goes up, you can at least cover the interest if it does go up. Yep, yep, yep. So what type of property would that be at 5 to 8% in your opinion? Well, regional. I think regional is where the opportunities sure. are. Um, you can probably do it in apartments, but that's not sort of my key focus at the moment yep. for apartments. Having said that, I've yeah, invested yeah. in Palm Beach, which is a different story. Yep, yep. <laughs> yeah. But if you go, for example, um, you know, when I look at yield, this really yep. depends on, yeah, location counts, but to me, yield is the type of property you buy. Yep. So what will you be looking for now at a five to eight percent yield residential? What do you think? Like house? What is it? Duplex? Yeah, it might have to be like a duplex. Or if you go to like a regional, you might be able to achieve it. Otherwise, um, something you'd have to add value either through like a uh, like a granny flat. Sure. That could potentially work, or add a separate dwelling um, on it. Um, yeah, something something sure, along sure. those lines. So you have to create something to add. Yes. Yeah, yes. Sure. Yeah. Well, look, um, for us, you know, we, we tr- also look at the uh, a yield play as well, um, where we were doing like, I don't know if you ever watched any of our webinars, but we were doing the co-living. Yes, the co-living. Th- that to me is yeah. can be a yield play. Now, mm-hmm. obviously, there's going to be, that is very area specific, mm-hmm. I believe. Mm-hmm. You just kind of, you kind of got to get the right area. Yep. You got to get the right property manager. But if you can rent out per room, you have possibility to get that yield five to eight percent. Yeah. Um, you know, other yield plays apart from residential. Obviously, you have got commercial. Yep. Um, boarding houses can do the same thing, but obviously those ones are, I guess, higher entry prices. Yes, and high um, risk as well, isn't it? Yeah, and high risk. Mm. Yeah, so high risk. Um, vacancy rates for commercial can be very long. Mm. You know, you could be vacant for six months <laughs> uh, on your commercial. But I do agree with you, Mitch, that. To get a five to eight uh, percent, that the actual property itself has to be u- some uniqueness to it that will allow, maybe a house with an attached granny flat. Mm. Um, just on that, my brother he um he bought a a property a couple years ago out west, and um what we were able to do was it, it was really run down, mm. Mm. and so with the six month period, myself, him, and my dad, we would go there and we we renovated it, and what we were able to do was the way the property was laid out, it had. It was four bedroom and it had two floors, mm. and there was literally all we had to do was there was like there was like a doorway at the back that we put a wall, like made that a wall, mm. and then what we did was was we put one kitchen in one side, mm. and then we were able to make it a split just like that, like it, yeah. it literally needed nothing, and then now he's getting two two rental incomes right from that right? yeah yeah and, yeah and it's like it's it's it was golden yeah yeah, yeah. so that's a great example by the way I yeah. love that yeah. I mean, we. Um, it's funny you say that, Mitch, because um, a lot of people have maybe a perception that you can only do this for old renovate and then renovate or add add a um, secondary dwelling. Mm. Um, you can also do it for brand new. Mm. Um, it depends. Like you could, for example, you know, you could build a four bedroom brand new. So you buy land, you can mm. build four mm. bedroom brand new, mm. um, and at the back you could have a studio. Um, or you build from scratch a four bedroom home with already an attached mm. granny flat, mm. um, and that will give you you know your between five to eight percent in Sydney. That's incredible if you. If in that's Sydney, achievable. 
Yeah. yeah. Um, we're always looking at those type of strategies as well. Yes. And, you know, if you do that for brand new, you, you can now also claim the best part as well, which is the deductions yeah. on a brand new property and your interest your interest part as well. So you, you can get two two incomes plus the, the, the tax um, benefits of it. So it's like a double whammy. Pro. It's a double whammy. <laughs> and, and then if you actually add all that up, that is that you're looking at probably six yeah. percent in Sydney yeah, that's really with good. with the growth. So open you can also open your mind to that, Mitch. Oh absolutely. Um, I did look into the um funny you bring up the what's the the, the co living. I did yeah. look into that um initially. Um that because of the of the yield yeah. that it was gonna be able to generate. I think that's something definitely to look at down the line. Yeah, okay. yeah. So for right I think right You'd now You'd have to me, furnish it though. Yeah, yeah. You do. Um well, I think right now for me is maybe getting that growth maybe in the equity first side sure. of things and then look to leverage that probably down the line for yep. like a higher yielding. Yeah. Property. Well it's funny you say that, Mitch. Let me know your thoughts on this. Co living, yeah. right? Yeah. The reason why we decided to do something like this was f- for both. You know when you say growth? Because if you watch any of my webinars on the, on co living and the locations, remember um, I always look at everything from a valuer's eyes. Yeah. So if if they are coming into an area, and that's why we do a lot of those comparable sales, is to look at imagine a four bed, two bath, two car, mm-hmm. is say seven hundred thousand mm-hmm. sold, like the last six in that area, and you are able to build a four bed, four bathroom, two car. Which one of those two is a superior property? Well, the, the, the latter. Because each room has an ensuite. That's right, yeah. Okay? Yet you are, you know, 30K under the what the others. Mm. To me, in my opinion, when you look at that, I believe that you will get capital growth yeah. without even having to, like, really do much. But you also have the option to rent out each room. Yeah. This is the way I look at it. Um, so uh, a strategy like that, I believe both capital growth you have the option to rent it out as a normal house for a family and they will probably rent it out more than the market mm-hmm. because each room has ensuite mm-hmm. already yeah. or you'll have the option down the line to furnish it and then rent out each room. That's right. Yeah. Um, so if you can get under the current inferior property, that's how we kind of look at brand new properties is can we get under but get something that is of what a value would probably consider slightly superior or maybe superior than the, the than the current market. What are your thoughts on that? I think the stats make sense. Whatever you just said there, that makes sense, right? You're looking at the, you've got, first of all, two extra bathrooms. That's, yep. granted, there's additional value in there. Yep. Just naturally, uh, there's additional, uh, inherently, there's more value in that. Yeah. Um, the different strategy you could take, having, you could, you know, like what you just said there, you could either mm. rent it out by room, or if not, you can still rent it out as just a single standalone, mm-hmm. you know, to one. Yep, yep, yep. One, uh, one yeah. Lee C, so. Yeah. Well, um, and that's why I think um, it's it's like your it's like how you did the renovation. You're adding value. Yeah. For us, it's adding value from scratch. Yeah. Yeah. If you kind of put it that way. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. yeah. And then you get the added benefits of claiming all the depreciation. Yeah. But do you think it's like um, in terms of like location specific? You, you mentioned yes. before, John. How location specific are we talking? Do you, do you think in the in the current market? Yeah. Look. Right um, the, the best way to do it is you just look at how many people are actually looking for rooms. Um, Geelong is a great example of, I, I think a co-living would certainly work there. Mm. People are looking for, mm. like if you just look on the platform of, um, what's it called? Flatmates. Flatmates, yeah. And you just type in Geelong and all the suburbs around Geelong. There's hundreds of people who are looking for 200 to 50 mm. a week. Mm. Mm. Times four, that's a thousand. Yeah. that's Like they're looking for those specific mm. rooms, but... You know, a survey was done about would they pay more if you had your own ensuite, you had your own aircon, mm. um, you know, and it, the fact is they did say they would mm. pay more because the reality is to try to get something 200 a week in Australia, anywhere, Melbourne, Sydney, you can't, you can't rent that unless you're renting, you, you, you're literally sharing like rooms, whereas this scenario is uh, you have no owner mm. in the house. Mm. It's you and a couple of others who are renting the room, or yeah. two others. Uh, if I can tell a quick story, when um when I was a property manager, um way back in the day, well, Jacob, you're a property manager. <laughs> yeah, I was. <laughs> nice. <laughs> for, for for about a year when I was 17. Nice. Um, okay. So I I was managing a property in Redfern, mm. um near mm. the city yeah. in in Sydney, um and 
it was a share house. It was an eight bedroom house. Mm. Um, and we rented each, each room out for about $300. And these rooms were probably smaller than this room we're in now. Mm. Um, they were the most dingiest thing ever. <laughs> there was one bathroom between the eight rooms <laughs> and $300 a week. Wow. People were paying. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, eight strangers sharing a bathroom and the oh. room was tiny and it was cold. Yeah. It was all, Th- that's like, like a boarding house already. Yeah. yeah. Similar boarding house. Yeah. Um, and that's the thing like with the, with the concept of, but you're right, Mitch, the location count. So it is location specific. Like in Melbourne, for example, I, I reckon Melbourne is a really good area to look into do this. Mm. Um, obviously, there's a slightly more cost when you build, but you know, that's expected. Even if Absolutely. you even if you buy old, even you the still raw have materials, to, right? Yeah, so um, it's expected. But there are areas in Melbourne that hasn't seen its population like mm. Sydney has. Mm. Like mm. you just, I would say, if you can set up a co living, it means it's already set up. Mm. So you may not be renting it straight away as per room, but down the line, as the population grows, if you're getting into the right areas where the new city centers are being built the new employment sections the new hospitals if you're doing that one day you can do it you know so um i I just think melbourne is ripe right now to be able to do that because they haven't stretched out their planning yet Mm. and you got to get there early um before rising costs of material come land's just going to get more expensive so try to get there like places like I believe you know the Merrifield City. Have you have you watched any of that webinar I did? Up no, going I didn't to Donnybrook. See that one. Yeah, I know the Donnybrook area. Like, yeah, I don't know where that's at. So where they're building that, um, I, I believe it's kind of going to be like um, Victoria's or Melbourne's mm. second city. Mm, mm. It's about thirty five k's north, mm. or, or probably a little bit more. Um, but they're building. It's the, the actual land size of this city center is five times as big as Melbourne wow. city. Right, that's a lot of stuff. Yeah, like so they they're land. doing a city center, they're doing a mm. um, commercial precinct, they've got a residential precinct. I, I it's almost very similar to Parramatta. So if you can get like land and house in and around that area already now and build that mm. in the future, when that population and it will happen, mm. that's you've already set it up. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah, I think Melbourne, and, and you're, you're getting it at a price that's affordable. If you do that yeah, in Sydney, right. my gosh, you're talking mil- more than a million dollars. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's a big difference, right? Like, yeah, still exactly. affordability. I can still see sometimes, I think last year that you had a few opportunities in Melbourne around the four, five, 500K mark. That's yeah, very it's affordable affordability. compared to yeah. yeah Sydney. What do you think of Werribee, by the way, in terms of um, the area surrounds? Yeah, that? yeah. Look, I Werribee's... Um, I have a love-hate relationship, I think, with the west of Melbourne. <laughs> sometimes I like it, and sometimes I don't. But um, if you're talking specifically Werribee, um, I like it more than the other areas like Tani, Truganina. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, the the unfortunate thing that hasn't happened to Werribee yet is that area that they were supposed to be that they were supposed to build, which was going to be the the universities and the um, all those jobs. That hasn't come into into fruition. One thing I've noticed um, when when I'm looking at the research in Tarnit, in Traganina, is just the planning of the areas. Um, It just whether it doesn't eventuate as like the southeast of Melbourne did, Mm. as the north and the northwest of Melbourne are doing now. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, a lot of people were, were who bought there were promised this train line or this bus Mm. network and kind of hasn't come into fruition. The other thing that, you know, I look at those areas is like, I always look at how many renters compared to Mm. owners. Mm. Um, At the moment, you're probably looking about 35% renters, which is not too bad. Um, But I believe, you know, with with Werribee itself, Mm. I think Point Cook, for example, um, is probably a more I don't know what your opinion is like in terms of living I think Point Cook's not too bad um, yeah so it really depends how far like if you talk about Werribee are you also talking about like Wyndham Vale yeah down that area Mambran uh, yeah. that area yeah yeah there's I hear aspirations that 
well, the government wants to take, uh, this is probably a news uh, segment that I watched, that they want to, uh, they, the, the vision for Werribee is that it's becoming almost like a mini Parramatta or maybe like a Parramatta in the next 20 years. There's whispers of that. Do you see, do you think? Well, it all depends It all depends whether they build that. I can't remember what it's called, but they were supposed to build like a city there. Yeah, it would make sense because it connects Melbourne and Geelong yeah. in between. But that's 10, 10 years in the planning mm. that mm. nothing's been done. And every time the government changes, that whole plan changes. Which is annoying, right? And yeah, it's so who's annoying. Depends power too. Yeah, so, yeah. but the, the the fact right now is nothing's been planned mm. at all. Mm. It's not like Merrifield City in the north where where um, companies already, like commercial companies, private companies mm. have are already putting leases mm. in that area. The Stage one is already built. Whereas in Werribee, I don't know whether, well, I have to find out exactly. They haven't even started that process. Mm. Like I see. You know, so yeah. Um, until that really gets the go ahead, it won't be. I, I believe anyway, it won't be that sort of area where you know people are saying to Parramatta like twenty years from now, mm. because it's, to be a Parramatta, you need employment. You need a dedicated center where people don't need to travel to the city. Yeah, true. Yeah. That's what you need. How long do you think? Because I walked in Parramatta the other day, just last weekend. Yeah. Great place. It's very built up. You can't if you if if you just first time in Sydney, you came to Parramatta, you wouldn't have thought this mm. isn't any different to like a CBD. Yeah, a lot of high rises. You know, big companies are there. So, how long do you think it was? Parramatta has been in the making since like its early. Oh, days? It's, it's been in the making since probably the late seventies. Oh, okay, so what? Quite yeah. a while. Yeah. It's been quite a while. Yeah. Like it was. It Parramatta was um, always there as a place that it was going to be built. Now, the true trajectory of Parramatta in terms of building really, I think, happened po- post Olympics, mm. 2000. So, say 20 years ago, when mm. true infra- like large scale infrastructure was now put there. Um, the Olympics did have sort of a development boost and surge in Sydney. And Sydney Olympic Park to Parramatta is what? It's only oh, like sure. f- yeah. five or 10 minutes yeah. away. Yeah, but, yeah. About you know? 10 minutes. 10 mm. minutes away. So, you look at, you look at that and. Yeah, so I, I think it's it's twenty years in the making of Parramatta to, to truly see, and it's it's still developing even more now. Mm. They're now connecting the bridge. Did you hear about that? So they've got the they're going to do the bridge now that connects both sides of Parramatta. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So, um, yeah, twenty years in the making. But you know, I ask you, like, where is what's Melbourne's version of Parramatta? Like, where is another major employment section in Melbourne? Well, from what I learned from, you know, all the investment opportunities, it sounds like Geelong is probably the next. Well, I next, mean. But yeah. it's a regional. It's regional. Yeah. yeah. In so, Melbourne, mm, other than that, I can't think of anything significant. Yeah, it's yeah, exactly. So um, I, I always see Melbourne is like that 10, 15 year thing behind Sydney. Mm. Eventually, they'll get there. The, at least, at the very least, they're actually building the suburban rail loop. Mm. Yeah, that's a big. That's I think that's a big difference. No trains to the airport is a huge yeah. like, setback. Because to build a second city, you need connectivity. Yeah, yeah. What well, Parramatta is successful because it's well connected to the mm, city, mm, connected mm. to the west. True. It connects. Yeah. Whereas in, in Melbourne, I, I think once the suburban rail loop is done, um, you will find that uh, during that construction is where the those those new what I call mini hub cities will eventually be built. Um, whether it's Werribee, I don't know, but I do know the North, mm. which is the Merrifield city mm. has already started. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. So places like Donnybrook, Mickleham, um, Woodstock, Cal- Calculo, all of mm. this will benefit from this area. Now, don't forget, this is going to end up being five times larger than mm. Melbourne CBD. Mm. So think for yourselves, is it a good idea right now just to have something there? Because, you don't want to wait until it's all done or, or most of it is done. So Is that a key reason why there's so many opportunities that you have presented uh, in that sort of north, yeah, yeah. northern corridor? Yeah, that's one of the key reasons because it will, uh, for example, the Fraser Rise area, mm. you're almost, you just go up a little bit and you're going to be in that major place, the, major, the new city, mm. but you're only about, you know, 30 minutes from the CBD. Mm. So you're kind of in the middle there. Um, it's like investing sort of Parramatta like 20 years ago yeah true you'd be laughing right now yeah you know mm. so 
I tell people like, you know, it's all about the foresight that we try to do. You may not get the um, straight away mm. capital growth that people mm. want, but to build a sustainable portfolio is to like, you know, build it over time. Yeah, but I guess property is a long-term game, at least for a buy and hold pro- portfolio. You have to be patient yeah. to wait, right? Do you find that true to be in your experiences? Yeah, yeah. 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 Otherwise, yeah. flipping will be your other strategy to... Yeah, you got to flip. Yeah. That's if you, a completely you, different ball game, though. Completely different. You can you can win, you can lose, yeah. um, and you're just recycling money there. Yeah. You, you flip, make the money, do it again. Uh, it's kind of endless sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, because I used to do flipping as well. So, okay. but it's just continuous. Yeah, you got to do this and then do this. Yeah, and then you find the next one, do it again. Yeah, make try to make more money. You make maybe make less. Um, I just find like I I I tell people just try to hold on to your property and try not to sell. Just hold on to it for the next fifteen or twenty years. Mm. Um, and you will wake up with all those options what we mentioned before. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm keen to hear, John. You mentioned you've used to do flipping, like. In comparing to like a, a buy and hold type of portfolio, do you, what do you see as the pros versus cons, the key ones between the two? Um, buy and hold strategy is really, I call that the foundation. You should do the buy and hold first mm-hmm. to set it up. Mm-hmm. This is what I've learned anyway. You set it up first because the, the buying flipping to me is, I, I believe, a much more of a risk play. Like you really need mm. to do your research mm. and your how much it's going to cost for construction. Mm. Mm. You need to get the appraisal from like before you renovate. You got to kind of know what you would sell it for. Mm. Then you got to mm. take into account if it's in Australia, mm. your capital gains tax, your agents fees. Mm. So you got to make a quite a chunk of you got to. I would say if you do doing a renovation and you're spending fifty thousand, mm. you got to make sure that when it sells. You're probably making two hundred thousand above mm. whatever you purchase for plus your renovation. So if you buy for six hundred, you pay six fifty. You mm. want to sell it for like nearly eight fifty because mm. mm. you're gonna pay CGT tax, capital gains tax on that, and then you got to pay the agent. You end up coming out there maybe with like if you're doing two hundred thousand, you might come out there with a hundred hundred thousand a bit. Mm. Yeah. Right. It, so it, then you ask yourself, yeah, I've made that money, and you've probably done it over a year. Mm. Then you get that money, and then what do you do with it? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> do it again. <laughs> you try to do it. So that, but then at that particular time, the market has also moved. So mm. you're trying to find a new location, which is mm. the va- you try to find value in a new location. You don't know too much about that location. Mm. You're relying a lot on agents and what they say about the area. Then you try to do it again, and then you might make less now. Um, so I would say a buy and hold strategy is a strategy for you not you at a not a 25 year old you mm. but a 55 year old mm, you mm, great you're setting up for your 55 year old yeah. self if you do that in the beginning you now allow yourself to take a lot more risk because you've you've already set it up so i think you can do both um what are the pros and cons again risk appetite but to me you must have by the time you're 50 you got to have you know your property is already set set up. Yeah, true. And you have to give it that time in the market. Yeah. Then take. Then you can do all the flipping you want, as long as you got those already there set for you. True. That's true. what I think. So the foundations is really in the buy and hold. Yeah. The, Basically, got, the pillars of the pillars. You got to set set up the pillars first. Mm. Then do it. Then you can even dabble yourself in commercial. All this and blah True. blah blah. Yeah, no, I, re- I really like what you just said. That that perspective is really refreshing. Just to you know hear that and contrast the two. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks so, for that. Yeah. Um. Hey, I think Mitch. Um, I think we're all, we've been talking for nearly an hour now. How long has it been? Wow, an hour. I mean, it's wow. <laughs> what else you got planned for the rest of the day? Oh, just uh, today's uh, obviously Good Friday, so um, day off. We're gonna have a go back, head back, have a barbecue. So oh. when do you it. go back to Melbourne? I'm going back on Sunday. Oh wow. Okay. Yeah. The airports are really busy. I know. I hear it's out the <laughs> out the out the door. Can you believe it? <laughs> yeah. Um, well, have you got any more last questions before we finish this podcast? Well, uh, maybe a couple of questions for you, John. If yeah, you yeah, mind. sure. Um, in terms of property, like why property? Why did you personally, you know, how have you come about property as a journey for you? Uh, very similar. Oh, man, we could be here for another hour now. <laughs> <laughs> Jacob. <laughs> Don't stop there. Yeah, stop watch. <laughs> um, well, so how did I come about property? Very similar. Yeah. Um, working. I was working and... 
Um, I had my own business back then, mm-hmm. which was totally not in property, which okay. was in like, um, remember those photo booths? Oh, yeah. Uh, but yeah. We, we designed one. Um, I think, I believe we were one of the first in Australia to have like a 3D booth that mm. we designed from scratch, even the software. Wow, that's cool. And we used it for not just parties, but it yeah. was for actual marketing events. Yeah, yeah. Um, for big com- for mm. companies like Woolworths and all that, so I was working there. Where I had about you know eight staff at that time. I was very young, like yeah. t- mid to early twenties. Yeah. And one thing really clicked was, you know, you work really hard. Um, you've got staff. You got to pay them first. You at the end of the day, you're the last one that gets paid. Mm. And I was like, yeah, okay, we've got this business, but it's such a daily grind. Mm. And just out of the blue. Um, my friend said, uh, my friend said to me, Hey, there's a seminar in the city. Uh, <laughs> do you want to come with me? I've got a free ticket. I said, what is it? And he's like, Oh, it's just this about mindset property. Mm. So I went and that's how it's, that's kind of kicked off my journey. So I was very m- much like you. I did all the courses. Mm. Um, I did the course. I did the commercial property course as well. I did the buy and flip course. Okay. Yeah. So every part that I've done was got to do with some sort of course, which I paid for. Mm, mm, mm. Yeah. Was, and that, was it harrowing, by the way, if I don't mind me asking, well, to, to sort of pay up for the Yeah, well, look, um, some were more expensive than others. Yeah. Um, the more expensive one, of course, was yeah. it's quite a bit of money you have to put down. Yeah. Um, but again, like at, at that time, uh, it was just I was just like you, just like, no, just, just do it. Otherwise, nothing else is going to change. My version of... You know, I, I had to think to myself, am I just going to keep continuing this? The more staff we get, or oh, back in that business, mm. the more staff we get, um, the more you have to pay them and all, all this other stuff. Mm. So I was thinking mm. there's got to be another way out. Mm. And having done all those courses, what I realized was, you know, m- majority of wealth being created in Australia, whether you are a, you know, serious property investor mm. or not, you might, you might just have a few. But over time, you know, eighty percent of these people's wealth ca- came into property, into in property, yeah. whether directly or indirectly. Yeah. Like they would have stumbled even upon it. So I was like, I've got to do something now. Like, and that's what it started. So, yeah. okay, Ooh. I did all those strategies um, in the beginning. Yeah, yeah. Well, it was really cool to, yeah. to hear that. You know, the <laughs> from your side as well, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Um, maybe just a question about what the future you think will look like. So we've been talking about Sydney, you know, properties and how yeah. the market's been going, doubling every 10, maybe a bit more so years. Yeah. Where do you think the next 10 or 15 years will hold for cities such as Sydney, for example? Sure. Do you see the medium going up to three mil, four mil? I do. I see, um, I see one thing I can, I believe clearly that will happen, especially when we're talking about Sydney and probably Melbourne, um, is that we will eventually be majority renters. Mm-hmm. That's what I see. Because mm-hmm. when you say, "Are we? will we be able to go to three, four million? I mean, you look back 20 years ago, mm. you ask the people then, will Sydney be one and a half million or more? What would they tell you? They'd be like, are you crazy? <laughs> There's no way it would be. Uh, it's the same thing. Like I think a $3 million price point in Sydney in 20 years, it's n- it will be normal. Mm. Okay? Um, and the... Inf- the unfortunate setback to that is people will just end up having to be more renters. And that is the reality that we face. You're going to be a renter if you don't do something. Mm. Um, and clearly it shows in other countries where property prices are expensive. Certain cities are expensive. You talk about London, you talk about Manhattan, you talk about New York. New York. These places, people don't buy they don't buy properties like only the rich of the rich buy buy mm. properties there mm. it's normal in these locations just to rent um and eventually i think um we will probably get there that i mean we're already seeing it now mm. do you know how many people used to own homes in 1970 oh you told me the other day maybe yeah if i had to guess like 70 80 was it yeah 70 yeah. percent for a 35 year old now we're down to like 40 yeah all right so the, you're talking about a span of 35 40 years yeah, yeah. it's gone from 70 to yeah. like 40 percent wow. right um so if that's happened in that period yeah. why can't it happen again mm. do you think the government will ever make prices affordable oh, 
th- th- that's going to come with an issue. They will definitely, in terms of election time, I feel like they will talk all this policy stuff, how it's yeah. going to drive it down. But I think ultimately, if it's going to make prices affordable, or call it like a significant crash, who do you think is the people holding the wealth? Do you think they're going to be happy is how I see it? Yeah. So, and, and, and are they going to vote the government in? So I think there's, it's a two way street. So it's never yeah. going to be as simple as just making the prices more affordable. Yeah. But like the, what, what is the mechanism of making a price exactly. affordable? You yeah. know what I mean? Like yeah. how could, what could they even do? O- open up land or something like that. Maybe <laughs> that's the only thing. We, Australia does have a lot of land. Yeah, yeah. Like they can open up land, but well, I think they should, that's what they should be mm. doing. Um, but it just takes them so long it to does, open the land yeah. up. Yeah. You know, five years of rezoning. <laughs> it's unbelievable how long it takes you know everyone I, I look at this way Australia is like with property the reason why it will struggle to drop mm. is because along the way there's a lot of pe- a lot of people are actually incentivized mm. for property to mm. grow and that comes in my opinion government council then you got the real estate agent true, true. yeah like there's a lot of money made on one property. Yeah, stamp duty as well. That's yeah. just incredible amount of stuff. I mean, you think about what the government makes on one house. Yeah, they they make money on both in entry and exit. Mm-hmm. So one house, you pay stamp duty mm-hmm. to the government. Mm-hmm. You sell it capital gains tax. Someone else buys it, pay stamp duty. They sell it again, capital gains tax. So that one property lies there. The government makes probably seven transactions over a fifty year period on that one house for nothing yeah yeah true so so in some ways that you would just say the government probably would even want you to make that transaction yes the more frequent the transaction the more money they make but yeah. the more frequent the transaction can have a tendency to push up prices wouldn't yeah it? yeah exactly and you think about people who want to sell their properties like why do you flip in the first place mm, mm, to make a gain to make a gain yeah so you know like you or, or me or whoever jacob he you you buy a property in the thinking that you're going to make money. That's right. See, one of the key fundamentals in Australia is, or anywhere in the world is, you buy property, you want to make money on it, right? No one goes out there and says, hey, I'm going to buy property and in the future make it affordable, <laughs> right? Who, who, who says that? No one, because property is the one asset that you don't, people don't really need some sort of, big massive education on it it's accessible mm, mm. they know properties they know air, people you know in their minds they know certain areas and i'll do this whatever it is so how do they make it affordable when us people won't make it affordable would you flip a property to make a loss not for the not for all the time and blood and sweat that goes exactly into it. it's just a crazy thought of it no. exactly so if you were to if you if your strategy is to renovate in the in the in your mind is to make the 100 150 200 thousand mm-hmm. then how are you making it affordable well not really not at all <laughs> <laughs> yeah so everyone is in property is incentivized for property to grow mm-hmm. right so can we reach three million four million of course we can because we actually wanted to do that be that way <laughs> homeowners when you the only people that don't want it are the people with no property mm. But once they have a property, mm. think about it. If I'm right now thinking it's so unaffordable, I wish the, I wish the market would crash, right? So I can at least try to get in. So if I was going to come in, so I, I mean, in my in my mind, I'm thinking, oh, like it's unaffordable. But as soon as I get in, do I want it to be affordable? No. Of course, I want my thing to grow. So you, it just depends where you are. But as That's soon true. as you get it, you want it to grow. It's so how, funny how the just mind switches. The mind like just that. switches because yeah. now you now you're on a different side of the fence. Mm, mm, true. Because you have it and you don't. Yeah. When you don't have it, you want it to crash. When you have it, you don't want it to crash. Like, <laughs> pick like a, one. Like a paradox, right? Is that the right? It's a paradox. Terminology for it. Yeah. It is, and and that this comes back to my point that. How do, how does a market really, really crash like the 40, 50, what people are saying? It's because we don't, I don't know if you ever watched my webinar, I'm like not not many people are in mortgage stress in Australia. Mm. Yeah, you said. At less, all. Is it less than 1%? Less than 1% are on mortgage yeah. defaults. You know, less than, less than 30% are paying above mm. 6% of mm. their income into mm. interest 
uh, into mo- the interest repayment. That's not much, man. People just have to remember that ma- the majority of owned properties in Australia was done on the previous generation mm. of baby boomers. Mm. They are sitting on so much equity yeah. and they've spent almost their lives almost paying their houses off. Yeah. So we're sitting and imagine them. Are they going to sell at a big loss? They can just sit there forever. That's true. Forever. There's no urgency. So no urgency. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So let me ask you, do you think it's gonna, it can get up to that three, four million? I think so too. I think so. Just based on historical trends and just looking at the data, unless something you know catastrophic happens. I like a war. Yeah, like a war. Something yeah. massive yeah. has to happen. Yeah. But in which case, we're all screwed anyway. So. <laughs> yeah, I think property is the least thing <laughs> yeah. you could worry about. Yeah. yeah, I think it can. Just the historical figures. I mean, you know, back mm. from property used to be five figures, right? Yeah. Six figures. Seven figures is not even like there's norm now. So <laughs> yeah. I'm not saying it's going to get to eight figures, but... Yeah, exactly. But yeah, multiples of seven yeah. figures is, I think, very much re- achievable. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, I, I feel very sorry for our next generation. Do you have children? Not, not at this stage. Yeah. yeah. Uh, at least you're setting it up now, but yeah. the, our next generation will find it so much harder to get in, mm. so much harder. Not true. Uh, the 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 tenure, the people in primary school now in the next 15, 20 years when they're looking to buy a property, oh, um, that's going to be tough. Yeah, we'll be wait and see, but it will be very different. Yeah, it'll be very different. Yeah. Um, any more questions for me, Mitch? Oh, good. No, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> Anytime you're in Sydney, please pop in. Um, we can have a chat again like this. Sounds good. Uh, but uh, I think that brings us to the conclusion of this podcast, Mitch. I thank you very much. Well, we thank you, myself and Jacob. Thank you, Mitch, um, for coming. Oh, likewise, thank you yeah, guys for, for coming. For sharing your, your experiences, um, what you've been through as well. I hope uh, members got something out of this as well. And, um, you know, I think bottom line with this one is what Mitch has done and what you've done is the mindset shift. And the surrounding of people, the different conversations you have, um, I think that's kind of brought you to this to this journey. Uh, let me ask you one last question. Sure. What's your next step in property? Ooh, uh, Do you have one yet? Has it been put in place or you don't know? So I'm waiting for the, the Palm Beach to settle. Yep. I'm working potentially with a buyer's agent here just to yep. look at an established build. That's probably my next step. But then I'm going to switch my attention back to New Zealand. So the other reason for that is lending is different. I think the banks over there don't really necessarily look at the, the assets I hold here. So And the yeah, lenders don't, don't cross like impact each other. So yep. yeah. So that gives me another way to sure, of, you know, sure. look into a different stream without having to maximize or feel like I can't get any lending. Yeah, yeah. Fantastic. Well, Mitch... Um, that's a uh, pretty awesome, I think, uh, next steps for you. Um, doing the established here and another one in New Zealand. I look forward to seeing how all this pans out for you probably over the next two or three years. Thank you. Um, at that time, we should come back and we'll revisit this whole conversation Definitely. again and you'll be in a different position. Oh, that would be awesome. Yeah. <laughs> so um, once again, guys, members, happy Easter. Uh, if I don't see you on any of the webinars, Hope you have a great Easter, great Easter weekend. Spend the time with your family. Relax. um, Enjoy it. And I shall see you guys again on our next podcast. And uh, again, thank you very very much, Mitch, for joining us. Thanks very much. Uh, And hope to see you in uh, probably the next you know, a few months or even a year, yeah. but I'll definitely see you in the project webinars. Yes. yes I'll see your name out there. Yeah. Okay. Happy Easter, everyone. Okay. Bye. Thanks, buddy. Thanks, Jacob. Thanks, Jacob.